welcome. The nation has a long history of supporting student journalism. Our Student Nation writing program has published hundreds of talented young reporters, most writing for the first time for a national publication. Our annual conferences have helped introduce and train the next generation of progressive journalists. And our fellowship programs have helped identify, cultivate, and nurture dozens of young editors and writers. Now, thanks to the great generosity of the Puffin Foundation, we're launching a new series of on-demand video trainings to help support the strong appetite young journalists have for practical tools of the trade. The first one features the inimitable investigative reporter, Ken Klippenstein, explaining why FOIA journalism is so critical and how it can be done successfully. The Freedom of Information Act, better known as FOIA, is one of the most important legal tools citizens and reporters have for furthering government transparency in the United States. It's a great way to expose government secrecy and abuse, and we at the nation have always strongly encouraged its use. Since its establishment in 1967, FOIA has been critical in exposing waste, fraud, and government abuse. FOIA replaced a, quote, need to know standard with a, quote, right to know threshold, putting a burden on the government to show that requested information should not be disclosed, rather than assuming the government always had good reason to withhold data from the public. FOIA law, or FOIA law, provides the ability to request records from the federal government as well as most public bodies in each state. That includes everything from school districts, police departments, park districts, mayor's offices, and transportation departments. Private citizens as well as journalists can submit FOIA requests. In December 2021, a group of scientists and medical researchers successfully sued the FDA under FOIA to force release of hundreds of thousands of documents related to licensing of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. In Chicago, the state FOIA statute has had some high profile moments, including the release of police, the police video from the night, a white Chicago police officer killed black teenager, Laquan McDonald. Writing in January, 2022 in the nation, Claire McDougall had described how Guantanamo is still a black hole of secrecy. But by filing countless FOIA requests, FOIA, McDougall and other journalists and academics have been able to help shape the public record on the prison that the United States government has tried to hide from public view. Investigative reporter Jason Leopold has filed 325 FOIA requests related to Guantanamo, many focused on the abuse treatment of detainees. One of the country's most effective practitioners of FOIA journalism currently is Ken Klippenstein, a DC-based investigative reporter for The Intercept, focuses on national security, government secrecy, corporate controversies. He's an avid Freedom of Information Act requester and one of the country's foremost investigative data journalists. During the George Floyd protests, Klippenstein's reporting uncovered documents regarding federal policing of the protests. Specifically, Klippenstein obtained an FBI document that stated the Washington field office, quote, has no intelligence, including Antifa involvement or presence during DC area protests in contradiction to Attorney General William Barr and other officials' assertions that Antifa is specifically responsible for instigating violence. He also reported that contacts working at the Department of Homeland Security were disgruntled about orders to generate internal intelligence reports on journalists covering protests in Portland, Oregon, as well as participating activists. Prior to joining The Intercept, I'm proud to say Ken was the nation's DC correspondent. I think you'll agree that his tips and trainings are invaluable. I hope you enjoy this video and share it widely. Thank you. Okay, so FOIA stands for the Freedom of Information Act. It's a federal law wherein um, anyone you don't have to be a U.S. citizen even, can request government records and get copies of those records back. Now, there are a number of exemptions, uh, you know, uh, there are certain reasons that they might not produce them, but the idea is that in general, if the government produces a record, um, you know, as a member of uh, the society, as a uh, potentially a taxpayer, as, um, you know, someone with a stake in the governance of the United States, you have a right to see what that is. And this can be a really cool sort of asymmetric tool to uh, turn back around the government 
uh, some of the most secretive agencies uh, this law applies to, the Central Intelligence Agency, the FBI, the Defense Department, um, the you know Health and Human Services, virtually any federal body you can ask uh, for these records and they have to produce them to you. Um, so uh, this can be a very useful tool for getting primary source documents to provide insight into what these agencies are really doing. So you don't have to rely on the sort of anonymous sources or individuals within the agencies who, uh, you know, in my reporting, I certainly rely on them, but they come to you with all sorts of biases and um, allegiances. I mean, they're parts of the agency and that's gonna color uh, the insights that they're able to uh, bring you. And so if you get these documents, uh, I always call them the receipts. These are the primary sources right from the horse's mouth. You can see what they're saying on a policy basis um, that can really help to inform a fact-based reporting that I think um, can act as a sort of bulwark against um, it, what 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 people have come to see the the, the media as it, at its worst, which is um, you know very opinion based and biased and distorted. You show them primary source documents; it doesn't matter what your personal political preferences are or where you're coming from. These are the words right from the agency's own mouth, and I so I find that it helps a lot with getting around readers' preconceived notions about you know who you are what media is so on and so forth you don't have to debate you don't have to you know um uh analyze or offer an opinion on anything you can just rely on what the documents themselves say and let people come to their own conclusions so the way that it works um in practice uh it, there's a bit of a learning curve in that um you know while most of these documents you technically can get under the law and you're supposed to be able to there's often a um, long wait list for uh, receiving these documents. So you can look at agencies like the Department of State or um, components of the Department of Defense. They have months and even years long uh, backlogs, FOIA backlogs, and this is a recurring problem. Um, uh, the reason for this is that um, they don't fund FOIA well, I submit, because it's a, a dangerous tool. You can use it to shed light on some of the most secretive corners of government and not just secretive ones, but uh, uh, you know, parts of government where they just don't want the public to know a whole lot about what they're doing. And so naturally, um, when you have a situation like that, why would they want to finance it and, and you know, give, you, <laughs> give you the keys to the castle? Um, so the, the law is pretty reasonable. It's the uh, application, it's the implementation of that law. Uh, that's run into a lot of problems where they've just defunded it to the point that these FOIA agencies don't have the necessary resources to be able to field the number of requests they're getting and they're getting more now than they ever have at any point in the past when which in a certain sense is encouraging because it shows that citizens are getting engaged and learning you know how to assert their rights and uh, trying to learn about these agencies but the downside of that is that there's not been a uh, commensurate uh, response by the agencies to, to to resource these FOIA offices to be able to handle the sheer volume of requests that are coming in. So a lot of the learning curve around federal FOIA is figuring out how to get your request to the front of the line. There's two different lines. It's called the complex track and the simple track. If you can get your request in what's called the simple track, you're off to the races because at that point, um, the Justice Department and uh, I can't remember, no, every agency, uh, they, they release statistics at the end of the year to the Congress to try to say, look at us, look how transparent we are. Look at all these records we're producing, you know, we're doing well. Uh, and if you look at those, it gives you a breakdown often of um, how quick the response time is uh, for these different tracks. And so if you're able to get in the simple track, um, they're gonna produce that to you in a matter of days or weeks as opposed to the complex track, which is gonna be a matter of weeks and months. So a lot of strategy in FOIA is trying to get in that simple track. The way you go about doing that is knowing exactly what you wanna ask for. Um, yeah, with novice requesters uh, who reach out for advice, what I often find is that um, they um, have very broad requests. They're like, I'd like to know everything about the Iranian revolution, or I'd like to know everything about um, you know the CIA's role in um, the drone program. Those are, from the perspective of a uh, FOIA records custodian, that's not gonna be a real easy thing to fulfill. I mean, these guys are not librarians where they're gonna go around and research things and come back to you with a you know whole, whole stack of files and, and, and records to answer your question. Um, they are gonna be looking for any reason to basically remand your request to that complex track 
so that they can say, oh, you know, it's too complicated. We don't have the resources to do it. So we're going to put it here and make you wait five, six, seven years. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. The wait really is that long if you get remanded to the complex track. So um, it's very much in your interest to know what it is you're asking about. Um, I, something I always say is that um, we don't really have a Freedom of Information Act. It's a bit of a misnomer. We have a Freedom of Records Act. Because, um, you know, if you, if you uh, and this is how a lot of people approach FOIA, they come to it with this kind of good faith understanding, thinking, oh, freedom of information, well, I can just ask them my question and they can answer it. But under the law, they're not required to answer any sort of questions. They're not required to do any research. All they're required to do um, is produce specific records that you ask for, and you have to specify what they are. And if you can't, then they're under very little obligation to produce anything. So there's a big research component to FOIA that I think a lot of people don't appreciate. I don't send requests out blind. If you want to find out about something, um, the best thing to do is start researching and figuring out, okay, what kind of documents and what are they called that are going to correspond to the information that I want. And there's a wealth of resources for finding those things out. There's other FOIA requests that are posted online that you can just Google. Uh, one of the most fruitful avenues for me has been to talk to retired folks uh, from whatever the agency is and say, hey, you know, I'll give you an example. I was doing a, a FOIA request to the State Department um, because Trump's first foreign visit was to Saudi Arabia, and that's very unusual because every other president, their first foreign visit is to uh, a neighboring country, either uh, Canada or Mexico. And so I thought, well, that's strange going to Saudi Arabia. What was that trip like? And I thought, you know, they usually shower them with gifts, particularly the Saudi regime. So I'm thinking, how would I find a, a, a list of those gifts that might be insightful and tell us about their relationship? So I talked to somebody who used to work at the State Department as a diplomat, and she explained to me, she said, Oh, there's a gifts registry in what's called a very obscure office I'd never heard of before called the Office of the Chief of Protocol. No way I would have known what this was unless I spoke to this retired diplomat. So then I uh, start Googling and turns out she's right. There's Office of Chief of Protocol produces a list of an itemized list of all uh, uh, gifts because the president is required to report those and members of the cabinet whenever they receive them from a foreign government. So I sent out a FOIA request for that, got it back and maybe five weeks or so, you know, not super prompt, but still quick enough for it to be within the news cycle. And I'm reporting it and the list of gifts was just cartoonish. It was like, you know, gold coins and swords and daggers and guns and things. It was crazy. But that's something that I never would have thought to ask for in the manner in which I asked unless I had spoken to this retired diplomat. So there's a big human component to FOIA. It's not just, you know, writing up what you'd like. It's, it's not, you know, it's not a it's not a Christmas list. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, you've got to figure out how to word it. And once you've got it worded in a way that's specific enough that it makes it hard for them to say, oh, I don't know what they're talking about. That's really when um, FOIA is going to produce the best sort of results for you. Yeah, so with FOIA results, uh, results may vary, as they say. <laughs> Um, national security agencies are going to be the toughest ones because they can invoke uh, state secrets privileges, national security privileges, and those are interpreted very broadly by the courts and by the federal government generally. So I'm not saying don't do it. That's the lion's share of my own FOIA work is to national security agencies, but that probably has the steepest learning curve. Whereas other agencies like, say, the you know Health and Human Services, EPA, um, I'm not saying the information is not important, but it's not going to be guarded with a, you know, <laughs> it's not going to be guarded in quite the same uh, zealous fashion, let's say, as the uh, national security agencies or, you know, say a small business administration or the, um, or the IRS or something. Um, those, those types of sort of domestic economic agencies uh, tend to, tend to not just be easier to deal with generally, but they have shorter backlogs. If you want to know how responsive a agency that you're interested in is, you can just Google the uh, uh, FOIA backlog and it should have a year by year breakdown of um, how big their backlog is, what their uh, typical response time is, uh, and, and that'll give you a sense. And I really encourage people, it, it, I don't think that this is um, um, obvious to folks when they're starting out with this, but just talking to the FOIA officers. These are often pretty nice people. They don't have the sorts of interests that you think of as, as uh, uh, you know, wanting to keep everything secret. Now they work for people who want to keep things secret, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they themselves will have internalized that. And if you try to word it um, in your uh, correspondence with them, uh, either on the phone or via email, and I would encourage people to try to get on the phone with people. I know that uh, younger folks don't like the phone. They're very phone phobic, but 
um, that could be a very useful way to communicate with FOIA officers because they know it's not being written down anywhere, and then they don't have to be worried about what they're saying, you know, turning up in a story somewhere or <laughs> perhaps getting FOIA, which you can FOIA FOIA officers as well. Um, they tend to be a lot more candid if you can get them on the phone, and if you try to word it like, and I think this is honest, try to word it like, I'm trying to make this request um, as simple as possible so that it's uh, easy for you to fulfill. They're going to have an incentive to help you because. Um, one of their incentives, one of their biggest ones, is to be able to go to Congress at the end of the year and say, look at how many of these things we fulfilled. We're so open, we care about transparency, despite this massive backlog, we're actually doing a lot of things. And if you think about it, what's the easiest way for them to maximize um, this number that they're gonna go to Congress with at the end of the year, is making it the easiest request possible, making requests that are gonna be two or three or four pages long of documents are gonna give you back, telling them exactly where they're located, explaining to them why the exemptions don't apply, just making a really easy case for them to go and make the case either to their boss or if uh, they're making the call themselves, to go ahead and produce those documents and say, wow, this is a really quick and easy thing for me to get five more pages towards our um, uh, grand total that we end up uh, showing to Congress. So that I'm trying to give you guys a sense of what their interests, what their incentives are. And in this case, I think they overlap with um, those of a journalist because you, know, you want things quickly. And if you can uh, formulate a request that's gonna get them quickly, then, um, then you know that can really be to your benefit, and um, you know they're they're not as um, sort of cagey and, and politically minded as you might think. Um, just try to get them on the phone, talk to them. They're people, just like us, and um, you know sometimes they're quite friendly. The vast majority of requests are not actually from journalists. This is a big misconception. The vast majority of requests are commercial in nature. So when you file a request, make clear that you work for a journalistic institution because you can get uh, fee waivers. That is, um, you can get your request process for free as opposed to uh, a commercial requester that's doing it in their commercial interest, which is all sorts of, this. so the most common request is gonna be from a business entity trying to collect information for whatever they're, you know, for furthering their profits, uh, business intelligence. You can go through what are called FOIA logs, Google FOIA log, FOIA request log for whatever agency you want. You can scroll through the requests. Vast majority of requests are gonna be ExxonMobil wants to know, um, about some contract opportunity that the Defense Department uh, maybe has so, so that they can try to win contracts or something like that. So if you get on the phone with a FOIA officer, you might even seem sort of exotic. It's like, oh, look, a young journalist, they're trying to find their way, that's nice. And you have to find, they're pretty nice people and, and, and you can um, you know, uh, find some in common where uh, I'm sure it's more interesting for them to talk to a reporter than it is for them to just talk to some you know, uh, business analyst uh, that's that's working on these kind of things. But yeah, unfortunately, um, requests in the public interest uh, form the minority of these information requests. And um, of course, private industry uh, is, is, is um, it comprises a lot of the backlog that we're seeing in just the, you know, profuse amount of requests that, that, that exist. So understand that, you know, when you call in, they're not necessarily thinking, oh, here's some journalist trying to poke around for the big scoop. Um, you know, you, you're, you're in the minority um, when, when you're talking to them and that can be, that can be beneficial. It does matter. Um, under President Obama, he issued an executive order that um, instructed federal agencies to come to these requests from the presumption of openness. That is to say, um, assuming that the number one value here is 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 transparency and if you're going to make a case against releasing records then it goes against that presumption now um you know we're all adults here there are limits to you know what that's going to mean on a practical level they're not going to start you know releasing all sorts of things that are going to incriminate the agency um but you know it, it means something i i would say that um between agencies it perhaps means less than you might think so for example um, from Trump to, from President Obama to President Trump, they had many of the same FOIA chief officers. So for example, David Hardy is head of the records division at the FBI. He was head of the records division under Obama. He was head of the records division under Trump. So I would say there's, l there's certainly a difference, no question about it. Things were less open under President Trump than under President Obama. Um, as far as I can tell, and I think there's empirical evidence to suggest that as well, but it means less than, than one might think. On the other hand, um, you know, there are sort of uh, political um, considerations. For example, um, when I got that list of the gifts from Saudi Arabia, I was informed um, after receiving that, 
that um, President Trump had moved a lot of longtime diplomats to the FOIA office. And I don't have direct knowledge of if they were involved in my particular quest, but I had heard that <laughs> there, there were sort of uh, uh, more rambunctious attitudes in the FOIA office after they had put out these um, very experienced and intelligent diplomats to pasture because Trump had feared some kind of liberal, you know, conspiracy against him. He put them in the FOIA office and, you know, you're someone who is, has a lot of valuable skills and you didn't do anything wrong. So you're probably going to be angry <laughs> and willing to help folks that are digging around and trying to find out what Trump is up to. Um, so that was a dynamic that I was told existed in that office. And I imagine that exists between agencies. Um, it's important to understand that these institutions are not monolithic. There are people within them that have their own goals, that have their own set of motives and political attitudes, may even agree with you on things. Um, and for that reason, I think it's really important to try to talk to as many people as possible because you never know who you're gonna find that, that might be sympathetic to your cause. Yeah, so I found all kinds of sundry FOIA experience, not just at the federal level, but every state has its own interpretation of FOIA that governs state and local, that is non-federal uh, records requests. So for example, um, you've got the Florida uh, Open Records Act, you've got the California Sunshine Act, you've got the Illinois Freedom of Information Act. Each of these laws, um, if you wanna learn about them, because they, they, they vary sometimes in important respects, I would just Google um, mock rock, FOIA guide and then the state that you're looking at. It'll give you a very nice summarized rundown of the pertinent points. That is what their deadlines are. Are you able to ask for a public interest waiver? You know, do you have to identify yourself as a member of the news media? A really nice summary of what you need to know um, when, when doing those sorts of requests. Um, I would say the FOIA story that I'm most proud of would be the last one that I did for the nation. Um, which was uh, actually a collection of a bunch of different FOIA requests I filed at the state level to try to find out about these uh, uh, institutions called fusion centers. These are uh, state law enforcement and intelligence agencies that work closely with the Federal Department of Homeland Security. And this was a very controversial um, development after 9-11. Uh, every U.S. state, I believe, has at least one. A few states have more than one. And the idea is that they are going to share intelligence between local law enforcement and uh, federal intelligence and law enforcement. Very little was known about these agencies. So I started filing requests. Um, like I said before, whenever something is national security, uh, you know, they will, uh, you know, pull every trick of the book to try to say, oh, this is going to cause the next 9-11. This is going to, you know, we're going to endanger people if we really, really see sorts of things. So I ended up having to sue, having to go to state court in Florida um, to because they have like three fusion centers there. So we sued over it and I was able to get a long list of what their what are called intelligence products are. That is the intelligence they're producing, really what these fusion centers do. And what, um, while I was at the nation uh, that, that, and you guys can find this story if you just Google fusion centers, Ken Klippenstein, uh, the nation. Um, and it really showed is that they weren't doing a whole lot. They were, what, you know, what was pitched to us, uh, bear in mind these fusion centers were established after 9-11, post 9-11, um, they were sort of forged in the fires of, you know, all of this public fear and panic about what could happen next. And so what would you think they're doing and how do they justify their existence and funding um, and authorities that they enjoy? They say, oh, you know, we're gonna protect, the, we're gonna prevent the next 9-11, we're gonna keep eyes on terrorists. You look at these intelligence products, straight down the list, it was, um, things as uh, frivolous as some guy spilled oil on his neighbor's driveway. And that was what the intel, that's what the Fusion Center was looking at. Another one was they were tracking some rap group around because they were afraid that the rap group, just some hip hop group was, um, had some terrorist sympathies or something. Just completely ridiculous stuff straight down. And the vast majority of it looking like, you know, these very um, uh, frivolous sort of things that I think the, whatever you think of fusion centers, I don't think the public had that in mind um, when, when you know when they're told, here's how much you know of our taxes we're gonna invest in them each year. And so finally able to shed light on what the heck these things even do. Um, uh, and and I got these records back from a bunch of different fusion centers. And to my knowledge, nobody had really gone through those sorts of things. But you, because in part because it's such a headache because they you know throw so many of these exemptions back at you. But in the context of a court, it becomes harder for them to make these sort of ridiculous cases because the judge is sitting there and it's like, come on, guys, this is <laughs> it's not going to end the republic if you tell them just the title of what this document is or give them a general idea of 
what they're up to. Um, but I've had so many different experiences with FOIA, it's hard to really, and another one that I was really happy with, and I thought was kind of instructive about how FOIA tends to go, was um, during the Trump administration, I sent a uh, FOIA request to the um, U.S. Embassy in Israel uh, to see their communications about the Palestinian Authority, because Trump had done uh, he something he had done that upset a lot of people, even on the right, uh, in the political establishment, was cut all sorts of uh, aid and assistance to the Palestinian Authority. And the concern was not that you know necessarily that Palestinians are going to suffer, on, on the, certainly on the part of the establishment in Washington. Their concern is this could lead to instability because if they don't have money to eat. You know, people are not going to be happy and they can, you know, cause unrest and things like that. Obviously, I'm concerned about, like, human things. And I'm sure most people are concerned about the human rights aspect. But um, there are, uh, unfortunately, other things that the establishment is worried about. And so uh, what I ended up getting back was shocking. It was the communications between the U.S. Embassy, embassy and um, the Israeli Ministry of Defense in which the... Um, a, a high-level defense minister in the Israeli government himself was saying this and uh, raising a red flag about how dangerous these cuts to the Palestinian Authority are. And this is coming straight from the Israeli government. So you can't say that I'm somehow being anti-Israel or something to oppose these cuts. This is the Israeli military themselves saying, guys, there is going to be defense and national security consequences if we don't, you know, give them some pittance to allow them to survive off of. And um, again, I don't have inside knowledge of this, but I would imagine that there is some degree of um, the Israeli embassy thinking, gosh, if we release this, it'll at least draw some attention to how crazy this decision is. And then uh, the American public will, you know, see what's going on. So there's, um, when you get in a very politicized territory, it's not always as hopeless as people think. There are often conflicts within the uh, power centers that, that run the government. Again, they're not monolithic. They're often fighting with each other in bitter disagreement over a policy and, and uh, uh, you know strategic um, objectives. And you can exploit that as a requester. Hey, conference goers, this is Ken Klippenstein. I hope you enjoyed and found um, informative uh, that that uh, FOIA video that you just watched. I'll be taking questions now, so feel free to put any um, in the comment section and I'll try to respond as best I can. Uh, my first question comes from Emma Dinsmore. Emma asks, when filing for documents, is it important to be affiliated with a publication or can I submit requests as an individual freelancer? Yeah, so legally there's no distinction between those two things. Um, with with respect to like what you're able to get, um, uh, you know, they have different categories. They have categories for um, media requests, or they have categories for academia, those sorts of things. But legally, there's no distinction. Um, practically, I don't think they make much of one either. I mean, I suppose it's possible that they might look at something and say, "This guy's from the New York Times. We better take this seriously." Um, but in my experience, it's never made a big difference. And I started out as a freelancer for several years, and you know, didn't have much problem in that regard. So I really wouldn't worry about that. Um, the next question is from. Olivia Capriati. Olivia asks, what advice do you have for college journalists when dealing with higher ed administrators that stonewall records requests and what best practices have, would you recommend for students trying to develop more investigative stories for their, their campus? Um, I, it, when you say stonewall, um, I think there's a big human component to FOIA that's often not appreciated. I think there are attempts to try to automate things and use, uh, you know, programs like Muckrock, which I, you know, I, I do think they do great work. But nothing can substitute um, the human connection of calling one of these FOIA custodians or records officers on the phone and making a human connection and, and showing them you're a real person. You're not some corporation or you're not some you know AI algorithm that's spitting out these requests. You would like and just like any part of investigative reporting, you want to try to build rapport with them and you know tell them what you're working on. Um, and you know just there's uh, you know these institutions are what they are, but but. Um, People are people, and they're going to see another person there and say, and think, okay, he or she seems all right, and let's see if I can help that person try to get their stuff. So I really, I tend not to approach this in a kind of like um, overtly adversarial way, even though obviously my requests are often going to be looking for things that are derogatory to the institution or some other institution. Um, but yeah, that that human connection is so important, and I would encourage you to try to um, es establish that with these uh, records custodians even before you send a request. Um, people just send these things out blind. Um, I tend to think you want to bring as many stakeholders um, in to help you craft it, because if you've had the records custodian help you, they will then have an incentive, either ego or otherwise, 
for saying, Hey, I helped this person do this thing. I, I want to make sure that it, you know, is seen, is seen through, um, and that, and that it works. Um, so that, yeah, try to bring people in before you want to do your homework before you send a request. Once you've sent it, it's too late under the law. You can't adjust or amend. Um, I mean, you can narrow a request, but you can't add things to it after you've sent it. So it's really important to do your homework beforehand, not after. And, and again, I would just encourage you to actually reach out to the records people and try to establish a personal connection with them. Next question comes from Nicole Rajgor. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, Nicole asks, as a student journalist looking to uncover the deeply embedded issues with housing at my college, I worry about facing potential consequences for my school. What advice do you have as a journalist that is constantly discussing topics on a uh, much heavier scale, such as leaked intelligence reports, international news, et cetera? How do you navigate potential backlash from the information you are reporting? Um, I guess I have a thick skin. And honestly, there's never been... I mean, my, I mean, I've had public affairs officers get angry and, and yell at me, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, if the CIA isn't going to do anything to me for things that I request, um, I would imagine the college is going to be, um, you know, less in intimidating. So I just really wouldn't worry. I mean, you know, we're in a relatively free society. Um, the consequences of journalism are going to be much less here than, you know, virtually anywhere. Um, and the reality is, you know, they see you as a journalist doing your job. They often... Uh, um, don't take these things personally. Um, and something I've often benefited from is um, targets of my reporting, thinking that I'm doing these things on behalf of somebody, <laughs> being convinced. I mean, in the right work frame, it's like George Soros is sending this guy or, or, or you know, whatever your political orientation, pick your bad guy. They often think that journalist has no agency and that you're just this handmaiden for more powerful forces, which is probably actually true for a lot of like establishment media. <laughs> But because of that, you can kind of like uh, benefit from those attitudes and have people think, oh, this is person isn't actually doing it. They're just doing it on behalf of someone else. So then they get angry at that other person rather than you. So in general, I just wouldn't, I, I really wouldn't worry about it. Um, Teresa Chukowski asks, is it difficult to get records when records were before computers? So they have it on uh, microfile. Actually, the reverse is kind of true. So I've done a lot of requests for the FBI for historical records. And in those cases, it's actually easier because in the national security field, um, you have, you know, national security exemptions uh, for things that may have been classified, things that are, you know, of some national security significance to the government, which they, you know, have an, ex an explicit carve out to be able to claim all oh, these are exempt. It could hurt the national security. So when things are more than like 25 years old, the arguments for that to be able to say, oh, this will hurt our national security are a lot weaker because it's like, well, this is like decades ago. How is this going to hurt your active negotiations or war plans or whatever it is? So I actually often see the reverse. Um, I guess you're right. They can't access the records instantaneously through a computer system, but to a great extent, they already can't access things instantaneously. Because I think people, maybe from science fiction movies or whatever, think of computers is there's the mainframe you go on the, the single box that stores everything but the reality is there's thousands just think about there's thousands of boxes that they have to go through and that accounts for a lot of the time consuming nature of these requests just think of your own life say pretend like somebody requests for requested something from you you would have to, you know you don't have one box where you have all your information you have your cell phone you have your computer you have um, hard copy records you have you know whatever so uh, this this stuff is often a lot more Byzantine and, and, and bureaucratic than I think uh, people ne necessarily um, appreciate. But but to your point, yeah, the, the longer time has passed, generally the less politically sensitive things are, the less classified things are. So I actually see, uh, it, it, I think I think it is counterintuitive, but I see the reverse of that. Um, things being easier over time. Madeline Jans asks, how do you go about story generation with a FOIA request? Does it always start with an idea, then a FOIA request? If you ever begin with a wider FOIA request that sparked a new story idea for you, all of the above. I mean, it, the way that I learned this process, I don't learn it from a book. I don't learn it from school. I didn't go to J school. Um, I, I learned this from trial and error. And, um, you know, there's, there's no, the thing I would encourage you guys to do is just mess around. There's no one right way to do things. And what I'm telling you now worked for me as I came up. It's I dated by now. Things are changing so quickly. I, I notice in journalism, when, when young people call me asking me for advice, I always try to tell them, you know, my knowledge is is pertinent to, to the time and, and place in which I came up. I have no idea what you're operating under, and you should assume that it's changed because everything is changing so quickly. It's crazy. Um, so try to keep an open mind and, and just experiment with things. I mean, there are some uh, general principles that I address in the video. One is narrowness. I actually start overly narrow. I ask for less than I really want. And then once I get things back, that will give me clues, hints about what else exists. And then I 
broad and I widen the scope of my requests. Because if you start out broad, you might not get something back for three years. And how is that helping your investigative process? You, I think a lot of people come into it thinking, oh, I don't want to potentially not ask for something that I'm entitled to. But the reality is, the more you ask for, the longer you're waiting. So I say make something super, I mean, mine are ridiculous scenario. I'll do like, I'll ask for like one or two pages, knowing that I'm not going to be satisfied with that. But that gives me clues, hints. Those two pages will refer to other pages that exist, other records that exist. Um, so that's a general principle. But again, this isn't physics. You can't derive, you know, there aren't laws about things. There are just generalities. And those are the generalities that that's the generality that's worked for me. Um, and also, you know, cultivating uh, human sources who worked in the agencies because they're going to know better than it. There's no way you're going to be able to learn more about the agency than somebody who's worked there. There's just no way. So why reinvent the wheel when you could just talk to somebody who, you know, there's all kinds of federal retirees. They have decent pensions and um, they like to talk. People are just nice. It's the biggest thing I learned from this job is like, even if you disagree with someone politically, people are human. You know, they're not going to be like, screw this person. You know, I mean, some people will be like that. But like a lot of people are just kind of like, yeah, journalists. Yeah. What, uh, what do you need help with? Just they're human. And the next question comes from Brent or uh, not Brent Scowcroft. That's another, <laughs> that, that person might have a, I, <laughs> respond very differently to Brent Scowcroft than John Scowcroft. But this is John Scowcroft. What journalists in your view are currently making great use of documents who are reporters in the field we should follow. It's a tragically underused tool. And I think that's a big part of why um, I've been able to profit off of it so much, not so much because of my genius, although I would love to think that that's the case, but that there's just very little competition. Look at the reporting that you see. The dirty secret of the New York Times and so many outlets, they're getting stuff planted to them by the White House, by chairs of congressional committees, um, by NGOs, advocacy groups. And I'm not saying don't report on stuff the White House gives you, um, but you know, if that's what the entire media is tooled to do, is that really benefiting the public to just be another person doing that? And even in your own interests, why bother competing at the same thing everyone else is already doing and probably pretty good and practiced at when you can just do something no one else is. And then at that point, there's no competition because you're the only one doing it. <laughs> um, so uh, to answer your question, reports in the field, Jason Leopold, of course, is excellent. He's kind of the um, most well-known, uh, but there are all kinds of FOIA warriors. There's a FOIA culture that exists of not even journalists. This idea that only journalists can use the tool. This is a right of all Americans. Um, not even Americans, anyone can use it. Under the law, the, the Russian intelligence service, the GRU could be sending for requests. There's nothing legally stopping that from happening. Um, so uh, this is a tool that anyone can use and that indeed a lot of people do use to great effect um, whose names we probably don't know. Uh, but I would encourage you to to try to dive into FOIA culture and just talk to people that are doing it effectively. I mentioned muckrock.com. There are all kinds of FOIA wizards that you can find on there that have been doing this for years and years from, from you know, just parents concerned about their kids' schools to, you know, national security, um, people wanting to learn, uh, wanting to find the declassified record of things that happened 25 years ago. Um, and And, you know, a lot of the guys, particularly the not famous ones, um, they're excited to find somebody else. Um, you know, looking at this stuff and trying to learn and they'll give you pointers. And, and in fact, they'll have a lot of records already that they might not even have published. Um, one approach to FOIA is not even trying to find new things. It's just finding previously released things because then you don't have to wait um, as long for them to process it because all they have to do is just send you a copy. So many requests. I think there's this impression that there are these, you know, gumshoe reporters that comprise most FOIA requesters. That's not true. It's mostly business intelligence. If you go through FOIA logs of different agencies, you'll see the most common requests are coming from corporations trying to, you know, learn things about these government agencies that maybe they're lobbying or, or that they're uh, being overseen by. And you can get those records too. If you go through the FOIA logs that either are posted or that you can request from these different agencies and just ask for pre-existing things it's so much easier than, than having them um, pull up a new one. Moving on to Zuri Pope. Um, Zuri asks, to what extent have extensive legal knowledge, to what extent is having extensive legal knowledge necessary for using FOIA effectively? How have lawyers and legal advisors guided you in using the Freedom of Information Act and responding to bureaucracy? Um, I have a wonderful FOIA lawyer who um, herself is a public defender, um, you know, uh, provides uh, defense against criminal cases uh, to uh, poor and indigent people that can't afford their own representation. And, you know, her advice is, um, uh, uh, you know, I couldn't, it's extremely helpful. I couldn't do this stuff that I do without it, but I did do FOIA for years before I knew her. And, um, 
And so, you know, I, I really don't want you guys to take from this, oh, you know, I don't have this or that or whatever, because I was doing FOIA for years with basically no knowledge. And, uh, you know, it's not trivial, but uh, it can be dumb. There's no question about it. And, um, you know, uh, there's a different type of FOIA request that you're going to bring legal resources to bear against um, than another kind. And so, you know, if you don't have representation, just focus on stuff that you don't necessarily need a lawyer to get is what I would say. Um, and lawyers are easier to find than you might think. I mean, a lot of them um, have to do a certain number of public service hours um, by state mandate, and and they're happy to. There's just politically aligned attorneys who care about things. And FOIA is such an easy statute. Um, if you look at the law itself, the, it's not very long. It's not very complex. It's not hard to understand. I mean, I'm talking about federal FOIA. All 50 states have their own in, a state interpretation of FOIA as well. Um, but it's not, you know, this is not calculus. I don't want you guys to get the impression that you need some you know, uh, wise and uh, legal expert to guide you through it. It's it's well within your ability to grasp. Um, Cheris Johnson asks, Ken, I like how you mentioned using retired agency employees to know what to request. Do you have other strategies to your process of knowing what to ask for narrowing your request to something tangible and specific? Yeah, I mentioned one a moment ago, which is looking at um, the FOIA logs that already exist. Those can give you all kinds of clues about what types of records, because when an agency produces a record, very often, if not most of the time, that is a routine record type that they're producing. You know, so um, uh, I got a story from FOIA once about the the gifts registry um, that uh, itemizes gifts that uh, the U.S. administration receives from foreign governments, um, which I knew existed because I knew a State Department official who used to work in the gifts office. And uh, it was called the Office of the Chief of Protocol. Now, I knew they reported the gifts, but I didn't know the technical term for the office. So she kind of explained to me, it's called the Office of the Chief of Protocol. This is where we keep it. This is how you word it. And she kind of guided me through this process. And I ended up getting a list of these just extravagant and insane gifts that uh, President Trump got from the Saudi uh, leadership uh, that ended up becoming, you know, not just a funny story in itself, but ended up triggering an investigation because it turned out that he um, allegedly had had not included all the gifts that he was receiving and again, this is something I would not have found out had I not talked to this former State Department official who, who who knew the ropes and knew where this stuff. It's crucial to know where things are located. Don't go into these. You got to do your homework before you send these requests out. You can't just say I want everything on this. You have to say what picture of you're getting the request. If somebody said I want everything you have on um, Trump or whatever, you'd be like, Do you mean text messages? Do you mean my emails? Do you mean um, books that I own? Do you mean letters I've written? Like you wouldn't know how to fulfill that and neither do they. So it's like, you've got to think, how do you make it so easy for them that they're incentivized to, to fulfill it? I can't remember if I mentioned this in the video, but a big incentive for these FOIA offices is going before Congress at the federal level each year. And they give a report to them saying, here's how many requests we fulfilled. And obviously their incentive is to have as high a number as they can to say, look how transparent we are, look how open we are. So how do you think do you think that if you send them a, a really complicated one, it's going to take a long time that they're going to get to that? Or do you think they're going to prioritize the short, easy one so they can jack up their numbers and have a big number at the end of the year? Well, they're probably going to do the easy one. So try to make it in their interest to, to fill it up by making it simple. Um, moving on to the next question, John, John Tof Tofigi, I think. Are there comparable equivalents of FOIA for state governments? Yes, every state has its own interpretation. It's called like the Sunshine Re Law or the Open Records Act or whatever. So um, there's two FOIA tracks. If you're requesting a federal document, you go through the one FOIA law. That's the, that's what the word FOIA is from Freedom of Information Act. It's a federal act. If you're asking for something from Illinois, you go through the Illinois version of it. If you ask for something from California, you go through California's, Florida, Florida's. And I would occur, and so the question is, so how do I know what the different rules are? It's so easy. Just go on muckrock.com, just type Google muckrock and then whatever the state is, and then uh, re records request. They will have a um, prefab request um, that you can just copy paste portions of. And uh, crucially, it tells you what are the oversight mechanisms if they don't respond in timely fashion? Where can you appeal it to? Because at the federal level, there's a clear appellate authority in each of the agencies that you're requesting to that can go to. At the state level, some of them have that, some don't have that, some you have to send it to the governor, some there's nothing you can do, you can only take it to court. But just look at that muckrock page, it'll summarize very quickly what the relevant statutes are and what you need to know. Um, do you think it'd be an easier, quicker process to get records from state governments? Definitely, that's a very important point. Whenever I can, if I have a request that would go through federal versus state, 
most of the time I will try to do it through state. Um, I have a funny story about this. One time I wanted um, DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency records, but knowing that the federal agencies tend to be slower, particularly DEA in the intelligence community, um, slower than state agencies, you can try to think, okay, is there anyone that this overlaps with at the state level? And I thought, oh, you know, they coordinate with the Chicago Police Department on certain uh, drug interdiction stuff. So I sent the same request I would have to DA, I sent it to CPD, Chicago Police Department, and ended up getting this back far faster and probably with fewer redactions than if I had sent it to DA. So anytime you can um, find the same records existing on the state level versus federal, I would encourage you to try to do that. It tends to be faster and easier. Um, and also, frankly, the, the state level FOIA records custodians are just less sophisticated. Um, I, I don't know how to say that tactfully, but it's like they're paid less, they're less well-educated, they're less politically uh, uh, attuned to what is going to be embarrassing to their bosses. Um, and frankly, they mess up redactions a lot more than the federal level um, agencies do. So, so yeah, definitely try to go through state if you if you can. Walter Thomas Patterson asks, how do you think about the timing of your FOIA request in relation to your story deadline? I don't. The FOIA stories are never going to obey a deadline, ever. Um, they are, uh, what do they say? It's like when you have a kid on accident. It wasn't an accident. It was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> That's kind of how FOIA requests are. They're never going to, everything is, sometimes you'll get them back in a week. Sometimes you'll get them back in five years. You just, you never know. So, so, um, and you know, this is really where the media is broken and where I appreciate having worked at the nation. Cause I can tell you, they gave me so much time to work on these things, which is crucial. If you're on deadline, you got to produce a thing every day. This is why there's no competition on FOIA because somebody does it. It takes, you know, a couple months to hear back and they miss their deadline and it just doesn't cohere with the political economy of the news media. Um, so I'd say, you know, in addition to not obeying the, deadlines is finding a job that's going to let you not obey the deadlines. That's why I freelanced for a number of years when I started, because I wanted to, you know, do more hard hitting stuff and not just write down what the public affairs office or the press release was, which is what you're stuck doing in a lot of these corporate outlets. Um, moving on to Caleb Dunstan, Caleb asks, what are the rules covering what can be redacted, kept secret? Can the government make anything they want off limits? Um, legally? No. <laughs> um, in, in practicality, with regard to national security stuff, they have very broad um, discretion in, in determining what they think should be a state secret, what, what they think should, uh, would hurt national security. And in fact, by law, uh, by, by case law, the judges defer to the federal government on questions of national security. Um, so, so the impression I'm trying to give you guys is national security is very, it's the toughest part of the FOIA stuff, which it's the part that I did. So I'm not saying don't use FOIA, I'm just saying it makes it much tougher. Um, but you can see the different rules they list the, just type in uh, FOIA um, exemptions in Google, and and you can just read from the law. Here are the list of exemptions. There's privacy stuff, like the, they're not going to disclose someone's medical records. In many law enforcement agencies, they're not going to disclose disciplinary records. Um, I mentioned national security. There's um, uh, proprietary records, like we, the, the, these businesses can claim, oh, um, you know, this is this is a trade secret. We can't release that. One of the most abused ones of late, I think it's winding its way through the up to up to the Supreme Court, is what's called the um, the uh, uh, one is ongoing investigations. And uh, so often people are like, can I FOIA X FBI thing? And if the investigation has not been closed, no, you can't. You just can't. It's in the law. Um, another one, it, yeah, the one I was talking about a moment ago, like it's getting abused a lot, is the. Um, Delib deliberative exemption. So the the idea is that, oh, well, we don't want to give you our draft document showing our internal discussions and debates because that 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 prevents us from having those internal discussions and debates, which there is, I, I kind of get where they're coming from. That does make sense, but they've, you can see how they would take advantage of something like that. So, so many records, they'll just, when, when I get leaked documents from sources, they'll give me so many things that they just reflexively stamp the word um, deliberative, like we're working on it. It's not a complete copy because that just tells the FOIA office don't give it to them and they just stamp it on everything it's crazy i mean i've seen stuff that's definitely not delivered it was clearly a final copy that they're disseminating to agency personnel for whatever the federal agency is so they love to abuse that one and that's that's probably one of the most frustrating parts of FOIA is, is deliberative so you've got to find a way to make it so that the thing you're asking for is like this is complete this clearly is not a deliberation that they're in the middle of this is obviously a final copy um bryce heard asks 
Um, you mentioned there was no distinction between freelancers and journalists with a company. Would doing freelance work receive the same financial exemption for their request? Yes, as long as you can demonstrate that that you know you've done journalism and that you're a journalist. Um, there's no there's no legal distinction. Ashley Ewald asks, could far right wingers have the power to take down a prominent media outlet all because they don't like the content? Like, is that actually something politicians can do? We see far sighted politicians attacking the media and threatening freedom of speech. Um, I don't really think so, at least not now. Uh, the First Amendment in the U.S., you know, I have all kinds of critiques of the U.S. government, but our First Amendment is maybe the strongest in the entire world. Um, and in the, I mean, just to give you an example, so uh, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, he recently was trying to um, change strength and defamation law, making it so that you can more easily uh, file a defamation lawsuit against uh, not just a journalist, but anybody, like a blogger, a, a radio host. Um, because in the U.S., again, like I was saying before, we have very strong speech laws, to our credit, in my opinion. Um, uh, and so, one one of the features of that of, of the of those speech protections is that um, if you're making, you know, if you say something about a public individual, not a private private individual, is like just an ordinary guy. Public individual is like you know substantially famous and elected official, somebody that exists in the public. Then they have, if you write something wrong, they have to prove that you wrote it wrong essentially with intent or with reckless disregard. This isn't the case with private individuals. There's much stronger protections for them, which I think makes sense. But in the case of private uh, public individuals, it's very hard to, and so DeSantis tried to change that and collapse the distinction and make it so that basically there's no distinction between public and private individuals. Anyone can get hit with a defamation suit. Um, and it, what was interesting about that is the right wing actually pushed back against it. All of these shock jocks and talk radio hosts, conservative talk radio hosts in Florida, they were saying things like, this is nearly a quote, you can look it up. One, one of these um, radio hosts said, this will be the death of talk radio if this passes, because they just shoot from the hip so much on those shows, which isn't necessarily a good thing. But if the alternative is just suing everyone for the slightest, I mean, like I'm talking now, I'm, I'm doing my best to try to recall, you know, with fidelity what what I know, and and but it's impossible to avoid errors unless you're writing something and have time to you know really carefully check everything if you're just speaking extemporaneously you might make a mistake should you be prosecuted for that and if it was an accident i don't think so and that's actually what happened is the right wing pushed back against the sanus was able to kill that piece of legislation ended up dying and i had a story on this actually um the right wing Koch brothers they were actually one of their groups i think americans for prosperity was lobbying against the sanus's legislation even though i think i can remember if it was charles or edward Koch had actually endured Orson is very strongly pushing DeSantis. So I think that shows you how strong the First Amendment is here. So I think it's unlikely that they'll have much success, at least in the near term. Nadia Scharf asks, when do you... Oh, okay. Okay, I'll take the last question here. Um, Nadia Scharf asks, when do you and your writing process link an idea you have to documents you can request? What does that link look like for you? I mean, it's not, there's no one way. Like I said before, there's no law. This isn't physics. It looks different every time. Sometimes the story starts with a FOIA, sometimes it ends with a FOIA. Sometimes someone just gives me something. I don't, there's, there's, I mean, I really encourage you guys not to get locked into a system because things are so dynamic. Everything's changing so quickly. Just, you know, do what makes sense. I mean, every situation is different. Um, so I would encourage you guys to be flexible. I hope that was helpful. That's our last question. I appreciate you guys uh, joining us and, and being a part of the conference. Um, yeah, let me shoot me an email if you guys have any more questions.